Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with blade collector, martial artist, and knife content creator, Steve Price. Steve has been impressing me for quite a while uh, with his amazing collection of ethnographic knives, swords, and tomahawks made by smiths from around the globe. But not only does he show his impressive stash of exotic weaponry, Steve is an accomplished martial artist and illustrates the efficacy of the blades he collects in astounding cutting demonstration videos. Steve is also a first responder, a family man, and a regular contributing voice to Thursday Night Knives. We'll find out how he got uh, into all of these amazing swords and also how he acquired those skills. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and uh, download the show to your favorite podcast app. And as always, if you want to help support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Quickest way to get there is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Steve, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. What an honor. <laughs> well, uh, like I said, I've been I've been watching you do these cut videos uh, for quite some time, and they are uh, they are really impressive. And the weapons you use uh, are are impressive and different, and uh, stuff you just don't see much of. That's why I, you know, I've I've always been kind of fascinated. Uh, with your collection and we're going to talk about it you obviously have a lot of really cool stuff all around you we'll take a look at but uh, i want to find out a little more about you and, and how you got to be skilled like that uh, but first of all we i mentioned you're a first responder right yes sir uh, i just retired january 1st as a <laughs> captain with a uh, engine 1b here in huntsville alabama i gave them uh 27 years and three months and uh, wow. before before that, from 1989 to 1995, I was also a Huntsville police officer. So I gave the city 33 years total. Wow, uh, that's awesome. I'm sure they thank you for your service. Uh, I've I work adjacent to a lot of first responders, and I'm always impressed by them. And I don't know the character to go into danger and to help out. Um, so uh, how, how do you think that that like working as a firefighter, working as a police officer, um, how did that stoke your love of blades or, or was that uh, around long before? Yeah, that was around long before uh, <clears throat> now, you talked about the martial arts. Well, my, my history in martial arts goes way back to the mid 70s because I'm a I'm 57 years old. So back around 1977, 1978. A man named Yong Lee moved to Huntsville from Seoul, South Korea. He opened up Tong Sudo Studio. And my father was in real estate at the time, and he sold him his house when he moved here. So me and my younger brother started our journey into Tong Sudo. And uh, that's how I first got started in martial arts. Uh, of course, all through those years, I was watching the normal movies everybody was watching back then, which was Bruce Lee in the 70s. And, that really stoked my interest. Uh, Billy Jack was probably my hero of all time. And that was just due to, you know, he studied Hapkido and was taught that for the movie. But uh, his love for the American Indian and uh, fighting for the underdog, if you've watched his movies, yeah, that really just sit well with me. And uh, so that started my journey to martial arts. Uh, Years later, when I became a police officer, there was a man here that was teaching Wing Chun Kung Fu. And that's a funny story, Bob. So you, you have to, uh, this was like, this was like a movie setting. So we had a motorcycle club that was in this block building on a certain street here in Huntsville. Uh, and in the back of this motorcycle club was the Wing Chun studio. So. So uh, you had to be pretty brave just to get to the Wing Chun. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, my love for Wing Chun started there. 
And uh, and then later on, as a police officer, I studied Yoshikai karate, uh, which is a brother to, to Kiyoshikun. Uh, Masoyama was the founder of both of those systems from Japan. And that's where my love of martial arts started. But a uh, funny story here, I never studied weapons during all those different martial arts. Uh, I just picked up the blades uh, just out of curiosity and from watching Forged and Fire. And it was just a natural innate ability to maneuver the blades the way I do. People always ask me, like, where did you study your blade systems or who taught you this? And I'm like, nobody taught it to me. I was just self-taught. Huh. So I, I, I totally assumed that <clears throat> since you've posted on your uh, Instagram feed uh, various Iaido demonstrations from Japanese masters, I sort of figured that that's where you um, picked it up or that's where you learned it because you're doing cut tests unlike so many, not cut tests, but cut demos uh, on bottles and paper and, and, and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but you're doing it from the draw, from the sheath. You're not you're not holding the knife in your hand and then cutting, um, and and I find that very impressive because you're always uh, kind of dropping the target and then drawing the knife. It's not on a post or anything like that. It, and it's and it's funny you say that because uh, there are Japanese highly respected Japanese martial artists. Uh, one of them was raised in the way of the samurai. His family go way back. He moved to uh, Poland and started a martial arts school in the way of the samurai and there's other samurai influencers in japan and when i started doing that bob that they all followed me and started liking what i did which was an honor for me because i highly respect those men uh and i don't count myself nowhere near the ability of those those individuals but it was just an honor for them to start following me uh so i i'm curious you did so many years of, uh, I can't remember what kind of karate, but it was a Mas Oyama. I know who he is, or, right? That's his name, Mas? Yeah, yes, yeah I, I just had a brain lock there. Uh, I had a whole magazine on him years ago, a, uh, and he was he was pretty cool. With something I always liked were, he, he used a lot of elbows, and I always liked elbows. Um, but what I, what I always wondered about karate um, is... Uh, if it's developed for fighting someone with a sword when you're empty handed, at least that's what I've heard. Uh, does that make it less functional these days? Well, <clears throat> that's, that's a interesting question. Uh, now I, I don't really off offend any of the traditionalists because that's how I grew up is in the traditional styles. Uh, but I have to be honest about what we're talking about too and transparent in that. My eyes got opened. Uh, I remember I invited some friends over in 1992, I believe it was. I may be getting the year wrong. But when the first UFC was broadcast on pay-per-view, I invited some friends over, some martial artists and some other friends. And I, I did the pay-per-view for the very first. And my eyes got opened with Hoist Gracie and that style of jiu-jitsu which I'd never seen her before. You had a few people, very few people in Huntsville that were doing judo, no jujitsu at that time. And, uh, and that was against all different styles, no weight classes. The only thing you could not do in the UFC first tournament, you could not eye gouge, you could not bite. Yeah. Everything else, groin strike, everything else was legal. And it showed you real quick what actually worked on the street in real life. Because uh, a lot of traditional karate with your reverse punches and your upward and downward blocks. And I understand about getting the technique down and the form down. But if you and, and but you have to spar. And a, a Kyoshikin is good about that. I will say that. Kyoshikin, those fighters are some of the toughest fighters around. Uh, I, I think they're flawed in, in one way. And, and that is they do not punch to the head. Now, they can kick to the head in their tournaments and knock you out, and they can do that efficiently. But if you always practice not striking with your fist to the head, and in real life, you've lost some of that. Uh, 
for me, uh, I would tell my children and anybody else that's interested, wrestling, Greco-Roman wrestling, Muay Thai, and Jiu-Jitsu. If you have those four bases grounded in you, then I don't think there's anything that, that can hinder you in that aspect. You're ready for about anything. You said four, but you mentioned three. What was the fourth? So the, I mentioned wrestling and Greco-Roman. Oh, 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 I got you. Yes. And, and, one I, of the... I'll throw in, and I'll throw in boxing in that too, Bob. Uh, boxing is good, but if you notice throughout the years with boxers that get into street fights, they're, they're, most of them are, are smart enough not to do that. But they're used to hitting with gloves. And the first thing they hit, and if somebody ducks their head, they break their hand, set their career back. Mm. The, the, the bones of your hand are very fragile. Uh, and, and, if, and if you watch Hoist and a lot of the jiu-jitsu guys back in the early days, they would use palm strikes uh, to the back of the head, to, you know, anywhere they could get. They, they, they would use that because they knew if they hit with the smallest bones in their body, you have a good chance of breaking them. Well, you uh, obviously have uh, quite a collection of swords, and we see them around you. Um, how did how did it come to pass that you were collecting swords? Uh, most of the people that we uh, know who collect blades are into pocket knives and fixed blades and things that are, um, well, let's say less expensive and more manageable, more, you know, and you've got this, like, wicked collection of swords and and things and they're from all around the world how did you start on this trip well i was uh, fortunate in that aspect uh the internet and youtube especially youtube bob uh then there were a lot of blade forums and i would i would get to see different makers and, and people around the world and and uh when i first started out you know being transparent when I first started out, I was buying most of my blades, which, which is, you know, as well as you know, is expensive hobbies. But when I started doing the videos, makers from around the world saw the videos and, and they saw how many people were watching and the followers that I was accumulating. And, and they decided to start sending me the blades. Nice. So I didn't have to pay for the blade. And what it did, it guarded them sales. So the, the blade was my payment. And, you know, of course, I didn't ask for any money or anything from the sales. Yeah, I was just honored that they thought highly enough of me to, to do that for me. And uh, it was a privilege and an honor to me because I have been sent some very high-end blades, some very one-off blades that uh, are just exceptional. And, and I will, I'll say this, too, is uh, I'm very impressed. And don't get me wrong, I, I love our American makers, but I'm very impressed with some third world makers who have minimal, very minimal tools, but they, they forge in the tradition of their ancestors and uh, they do an exceptional job. All right. So uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were uh, first uh, talking to one another, you wanted to hold off to talk to me until you got a certain new something. Uh, what is that? I'm dying to see what you got. Okay. So I'll try to show this up close, the sheath. Oh. But if you can see that sheath, it is remarkable. So this blade is called the Yakubo. And what that stands for is, is what a Yakuza in Japan, you know, it's like we have the mafia over here. Japan has the Yakuza. That's their games. What they would carry if they were carrying a Bowie knife. Ooh. So I'm going to show you, like, I'm going to get over here, show you, get close, show you the blade, and then show you this handle. I'm going to stand up. Ooh, wow. Uh, what is that? A burl handle? That was like burl. Wow. It is in its full tang. It is an exceptional blade. 
And when I say extremely sharp, I'm going to do a video with it. It is extremely sharp. Uh, this came from Mohammed Hassan Saeed out of Indonesia. He owns Delicraft, and he makes some superior blades. Uh, I've already done it, and, and here's the thing, too. His Delicraft emblem is here. He put my initials on the blade. Oh, cool. And uh, like I said, I, I told you I'd already done the uh, free fall paper cut test, and it was nothing for this blade. So that's where I take a piece of paper, uh, like a computer sheet of paper, I drop it and cut it midair. And it went through it like nothing. It was incredible. The, uh, the tip of this blade is amazing. And just, you can see the, how they forged this blade. And it is just, I can't tell you how remarkable it is. It's very light, extremely light in the hand. I should have weighed it. But I can tell you for the blades I own, it's one of the lightest blades I own. 12 inch blade, six inch handle. It is just unreal. So uh, this is made in Indonesia. What Do you have any idea what the conditions are? Um, I've seen a lot of Filipino cutlers and it's it, it to our to our Western eye, it looks somewhat primitive or or at least um definitely uh somewhat impoverished i guess is uh, yes. that's not exactly the right term but no, no, that's, you know that's, that's correct very minimalistic very basic uh, just it, it's very minimal tools and and bob that's what's most impressive to me is uh i've seen this from one of my good friends perna Danal from nepal I've seen this from Muhammad and some others. Uh, those are men of integrity. If they tell you they're going to make you a blade and send it to you in this amount of time, that's what they do. And they're in there on their knees, squatted down, hot, over the coals, forging a blade with, with a guy, two, one or two guys hammering it out hmm. while they're moving it in and out, tempering the blade, forging it, and... I have a lot of respect for those men because uh, here in America, I have run into it. There's a lot of people running into this of having a blade made and it takes six months, a year, two years, three years to get a blade. <laughs> and so uh, you have to wonder sometimes about people's work ethic uh their integrity when it comes to that but the men i i mentioned are men of integrity uh do you think some of that might have to do with the fact that uh i don't know i guess I, a lot of the cutlers i've seen are maybe a little bit older and they're doing something in the traditional way and it's kind of in their uh it's like reflexive yes I mean, and it is. They've been doing it for so long. Their ancestors have done it. So, and, and that's the thing. You, over here in America, we are we have a, amazing blade smiths. We we have amazing blade smiths uh, that make amazing blades. But those cultures, for instance, in Nepal, Indonesia, uh, over in, or even over in China, and I'm, I'm talking about the traditional makers over there traditional makers in japan filipino makers the philippine the philippines indonesia nepal those are blade cultures so if you go back hundreds and hundreds of years they've been making blades forever and and so in blade cultures yes they they can they can forge out a blade fairly quick yeah um uh, like in the philippines it's an archipelago, many, many, many islands, and each island has towns, and each town has their blade designs, and their different uh, smiths who do different versions of old designs, and I, I just love that. I love that um, what that traditional panoply that you see sometimes of all the different Filipino blades on on the shield. I don't know. I used to have a T-shirt of that. I, I love looking at that because 
they're so varied. And that's what I love about, uh, well, your collection, for instance, is uh, I, I have a little bit of ethnographic weaponry around me that uh, my parents have gotten on their travels or that I've uh, gotten when I lived in New York and had uh, access to flea markets and stuff like that, where I found some real gems, especially bringbacks. Um, but uh, all the variety of shape and, and um, kind of use that you get from weapons and knives from around the world. What uh, is your uh, wheelhouse, if you will? What are the kind of knives and swords that you really uh, go after? So anybody that knows me and, this, I'll, this is, there's a story behind this. So the Kupri, and I have weapons from all over the world, uh, and I love them all. But for me, it's I can't explain it. Uh, there's a Nepalese man, which, you, you know, being a Christian, we have different beliefs. But some of the Nepalese men have followed me over there for a while. And, and see me do the things with the Kukri, especially the reverse fast draw yeah. with the Kukri. This one is from Purna Darnal of Nepal, one of my best friends. Uh, I, I love that man. This Kukri weighs about 11 ounces. God, it that is, is gorgeous. It is extremely, extremely fast. The edge geometry is superb, and it's razor, razor sharp. I can, this is probably one of my fastest blades in the hand. I can maneuver this so fast, like it's just a blur. Uh, but when I started doing all the cut tests and, and the draws and everything, one of the men over there, we got to talking, uh, messaging back and forth, and I had a lot of respect for him. And uh, he said something about me and maybe that I had been in a previous life. <laughs> so. You know, uh, and, and they believe in that. There's there's a lot of Hindu religion over there and, and different. But, of course, Bob, I, I, I was honored that he said that. Sure. Course, I have a different belief in that, being a Christian. But I was honored that he thought that uh, about me and, and the Kukri because he, he could see how I could, how I could do with this blade. And I, I would always tell him, I said, I don't know what it is. I said, this blade... It's just an extension of me, and it's just innate in me. I couldn't explain, Bob. It's like this blade's always just been with me. It's like I'm most comfortable with this. It's like natural. It's something that's it's a part of me, and I can't explain it. Uh, I, I can't. Are you but talking this, about this the? This is my favorite style blade. So you're talking about the Kukri in general, um, yes. not necessarily that specific one in your hand. Right, the kukri in okay. general. Okay. Now, now there are there are different sizes and weights of the kukri. This this one you just put away is so nice and slender. Yes. I love the look of that. It it it's uh, looks like that's going to be a really nice one. Let's see that. Oh my! So no. this is this is probably one of the most beautiful kukris I have. This is the Papa kukri, and this one, if you can see the width of the blade Whoa. and the fullers and that blade, and if you can see the handle, let's see. So it's got that the brass fittings, the beautiful, is that yeah. buffalo, a water buffalo horn? It is, buffalo horn. So this blade is a lot wider and it's heavier than the previous blade, but... The edge geometry on this blade, Bob, is such that uh, I, I took a Clorox bottle, a big, the big Clorox bottle, like the gallon jug, and I rinsed it out real well because I didn't want to damage my blade. And I, I filled it up completely with water. And I just held it up. And I had I already had the kukri in hand. And I just dropped the container and I sliced it. And I, I showed the, the container uh, in the picture of that post I made. And it looked like, no joke, that a circular saw had made the cut, a fine circular saw. It was that clean. It, it was amazing. So that, that's due to the edge geometry and the sharpness of that blade. 
So kukri, how many kukris do you have, uh, would you say, in your collection? I'll probably have, let me just think about that. Maybe 30. All right. All right. So 30. Uh, okay. Kukri is definitely your thing. And we were talking about the copus that's over your left shoulder. That's kind of a, that's like a proto kukri. Um, uh, so we know that that's your, what, what else, what else uh, is, is out there in the world that's fetching? Is that a Krabi Krabong sword behind you? So <clears throat> The Corda. This is this is the Corda sword. This is made by Perna, and this is an amazing, amazing sword. Oh, uh, I've seen this on Forged in Fire. That is really cool. Yes, it's like a sword axe. Yes. So, the all the inside is sharpened, and I'll let you see. Oh yeah. See the detail on that. And then of course the pommel. But this sword is extremely light in the hand. It's it's amazing. So on this blade, like I said, the inside is sharpened. But if that point catches it comes in and draws everything into it. And that point is razor, razor sharp. So that's the Corda sword. So this sword is popular in Nepal and in India. But Perna, Perna forged that, and it's one of my prize blades. I'll never sell that one. That's a, that's just a prize blade to me. So how did you start making content uh, for for social media for YouTube and Instagram? Like. Uh, what what was it that drove you to that? Well, you know, I've seen other people start doing the videos and everything, Bob. And then I think somebody at the fire department, actually, uh, one of my firefighters might have said something to me about, you know, maybe I should start doing the videos and doing that. And uh, so I, I started, I mainly do Facebook and Instagram. And I'll, I, every once in a while, I'll post to YouTube. Now, there was a man in Las Vegas. Uh, a good friend of mine who has a huge collection of blades. He's an older gentleman and he was going to sponsor me on YouTube and everything. But I'll tell you how, how I am, Bob. I, uh, I, I go with how I feel, if that makes any sense. Like uh, I know that there are bladesmiths who do take a lot of time because they have to have the right mindset and feeling when they start forging a blade, they may start forging it out. They may take a week off and then go back to it mm -hmm. until they get the right frame of mind and have the right feeling toward it. That's, that's my, my way of doing the videos is I, I, I don't want to be like under the gun, so to say, like that it's a burden to have to do videos. I love to do them, but I have to do them. Go by my feeling, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and express myself in that way. But yeah, that's how I got started. Is I, I saw other people doing it, and then somebody at the fire department, I believe, said, Steve, y'all start doing that. And it was just a natural thing. I was, I was seeing other people do it, and I just started out doing test cut videos of different blades. It was a really simple test. And then it went from that to, uh, I decided, well, let me see if I can draw a blade. And let me see if I can draw it fast. And then let me see if I can draw it fast enough to cut a container that I just dropped out of my hand. <laughs> and uh, that's how it progressed. Just that, that, that simple. So how, how has watching yourself uh, do those cut tests improved your uh, skills with the sword? Oh, it, it does a lot because it's trial and error. Uh, timing is everything on those, those cut tests. Uh, and you have to be fast, but you also have to be careful because there's a fine line when you're dealing with a live blade, uh, a very fine line. <laughs> I, I have found that out the hard way before. Uh, and uh, But 
you're not going to progress in anything if you stay scared or if you let something uh, discourage you. And I've had a lot of people encourage me from the Blade community. Because I don't know if you knew this, Bob. I had an accident back in February of last year. Hmm. So I had a very, very sharp blade. It was a big Kardashian, Kardashian Japanese style, uh, razor sharp. Uh, the blade itself was about a little over five inches with a tip that I would say is probably my most it'll penetrate any clothing, anything like it's not even there. It's, it's the best penetrator I have, uh, the best thrusting weapon I have. And I was doing a quick draw from underneath my shirt. Oh yeah. Yes. I, I wasn't, I, I wasn't doing a video, thank God at the time, but, uh, I had it in a sheath underneath my shirt <coughs> to draw it up with my right hand. I was going to pick up the shirt with my left hand. I've done this numerous times. And my philosophy of why I was doing that is I felt like no matter where you are, you ought to be able to draw fast, just out of the blue mm -hmm. for, for real world application. So I did it, didn't pull the shirt up high enough. Oh. The butt of the blade caught my shirt, rebounded in at a transverse angle into my abdomen, mm. through my stomach. So at the time, I didn't know. I, I went and grabbed the washcloth and was holding pressure. I needed to do that. And uh, I was just hoping that it was just stuck in the muscle, didn't, didn't penetrate any further. But by the time I got to the emergency room and they put me back uh, to the CAT scan, I had a fortunate for me, I had probably the number one trauma doctor that was on call that, that night. And he came back and said, Steve, I got bad news. You're bleeding internally. Oh, my God. So he had to do emergency surgery. He had to go in, scope me three different places, sew me up from the inside and from the outside. And after that, you know, yeah, that's a that's a traumatic experience. I, I'll, I'll say, you know, it, it, it is traumatic. But I have a, I had a lot of people that I highly respect message me, call me, and encourage me. Cause they knew it was going to be an overcoming hmm. to get back to do what I, I was doing. Uh, and I appreciate everybody that called me, messaged me, made a post on the Facebook page. When I made a post about that, I want everybody to know how precious you are to me. That meant the world to me. And, uh, it was just one of those things, you know, and, and I would advise anybody, that's practicing to use a training blade from, from, from cover, use a training blade. Uh, cause it, it can happen to anybody, but yeah, that, that was an experience. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, that you're really underlining that it can happen to anybody because you're obviously, uh, skilled and you do a lot of that. Uh, you've done a lot of that quick draw stuff that we've seen and yeah, but from under the shirt catching on the, catching on the shirt and pushing it right in i mean i i could totally visualize that and man that's that's awful uh, but like you said anyone can make a mistake like that and uh, i have um not uh not as high stakes as yours uh because i wasn't doing anything as high stakes as you but um that's a learning experience for sure and and not that you didn't have ultimate respect for the blade but that'll give you even more of it Absolutely. I bet. yeah uh, so on the job uh over over the years as a fireman and as a policeman um did you see uh the damage that knives can do to people from fights and stuff like that was that something you were around at all uh mostly mostly gunshots but i'll, mm -hmm. I'll say this it's because I, I i'm no longer a police officer so i can talk about it but when I was a rookie police officer here in Huntsville, I, I saw what a uh, an axe can do to a person. Uh, I'm trying to think if it was an axe or a machete. Either way, at that time, I, I can't recall if it was an axe or a machete. It might have been a machete. It was at a hotel here in Huntsville. And we get there, and the guy had been hit in the head with it. And uh, needless to say, 
the, the head is no no match for machete. Uh, yeah, it was it was very bad, Bob. Uh, so yeah, I, but my, mainly what I've been involved with is, is gunshots. They're more prevalent here in Huntsville than the knives are. Although there are people that get stabbed, uh, you know, quite often, but mainly mainly we don't hear about those a lot. Mainly it's gunshots. Uh, that's uh, yeah, that's a. Uh, just incidentally, I'm going to be shooting a video soon with a fire department around here about stopping bleeding, you know, excessive bleeding from things like gunshots and stabbings or whatever. You know, you 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 could be out swimming and you cut yourself on a piece of metal, whatever it is. Uh, but uh, how how important is it for us knife uh, dudes and dudettes to learn medical stuff uh first aid stuff like real legit first aid oh it, it is absolutely important i mean the first thing i did when i had my accident right away about in a split second was grab a, a washcloth and do compression on my abdomen you can't put a tourniquet on an ab abdomen <laughs> so yeah. there are places on your body that a tourniquet is not going to help but i would i would be very familiar with tourniquet application uh compression everything like that and and, and just wound mitigation so if you're around blades at all you definitely definitely need that knowledge uh because you can cut a place in your arm you can hit an artery you you know i remember a, a man that i followed for a while on youtube was very very proficient with a katana and i mean extremely proficient but he had one that was a little longer that he had just gotten and mainly, you know, they're, they're around 28 to 29 inch blade length. This one, I think, might have been over 30. And he did a draw, and he hit the upper part of his mm -hmm. arm right here when he drew it. And I don't know if he just nicked the artery or whatever, but he didn't hit he didn't hit it all the way through. But it 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 just put him down for a while hitting that place. Uh, and the break, so you got a brachial artery that runs right through there, and uh, he might have nicked it, whatever. But he, I know it scared him because he was off for a little while off the channel, but then he came back and talked about it, and he learned from that experience of what blade length he could draw that technique proficiently with. He'd been doing the draw with the 28 29 inch blades all along, and when he had that longer blade and coming up it did not make it out of that area without cutting. So, uh, yes, learning how to mitigate that is essential for anybody dealing with a blade. Uh, I, I highly recommend that. I find myself sometimes absentmindedly, uh, um, playing with or handling, uh, whatever knife happens to be on me or in my pocket. Um, and I'm, I'm okay with that if I'm stationary, say if I'm sitting at my desk uh, and I'm just absentmindedly playing with a knife. Worst I can do is probably cut my hand or something, but uh, I'll find myself walking around doing that and I have to stop myself, put it back because that's that's how I've done dumb dumb stuff. Uh, and I'm not calling, um, you know, not not every knife mistake is a dumb mistake, but I've made some really stupid ones. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've been lucky. Uh, that I haven't um, hit the wrong spot. Actually, the worst, some of the worst accidents I've ever had was when I worked in professional kitchens, you know, just as a, as a prep guy, but, but still those big knives and just uh, coming in early in the morning and prepping all sorts of food and doing it absentmindedly. So yeah, it's a mindfulness is a pretty important thing, especially around blades. How much of what you do, especially with these, um, with the cutting and with the drawing and cutting, how quickly you do it, how much of that uh, is a mind game? Yeah, it, 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 it starts with the mind, Bob. Uh, your focus has to be there. There, there, can, there cannot, it has to be focused. I've done a couple of uh, blindfold cut tests where I blindfold myself and do the draw and cut. And you have to have spatial awareness body awareness and you have to be dialed in in the zone nothing else can be on your mind uh nothing exterior 
you can't be thinking about something, anything, anything else has to be cleared out of your mind. Uh, you know, we Americans, we call it being zoned in. Uh, and that will mitigate a lot of the problems. But you have to have respect for the blade because you know what I use are live blades. Uh, and, and what people can, they can make a mistake by watching certain individuals that are just drawing blades really fast, especially in the katana arena. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those katanas are not shinkins. They're not, they're not sharpened swords. And those people can get away with that. They can draw extremely fast, put it, resheet it extremely fast, back and forth, back and forth. And don't get me wrong. That's a good way to familiarize yourself, practice it, practice it, practice it. And then when you get to a live blade, you've got the fundamentals and the foundation built. But it's totally different when you put a live blade in your hand. If, if you've only been doing non-sharpened blades all your life for many years, and then you put a live blade in there, it, it's a different mindset, totally different mindset. Uh, do I, I believe you have to have both. I believe you need to train with an unsharpened blade and train with a live blade. Even though I, I started with live blades and, and, and you know, but it, it, you know, that one time it did cost me. But, I, I, I would be better off on certain areas if I would get me some training blades and practice and practice and practice and, and get some more fundamentals down to sharpen my skills even more. Uh, but yeah, don't, I, I don't want people to make that mistake of, of watching somebody who does something extremely fast and going down that road. It, it takes time and time and effort and concentration uh, and knowing your own abilities, you have to know yourself above all other. You know, you, you have to know what you're capable of and what your limitations are. I know what my limitations are, uh, and I try to stay right there at that, lim that limit, not go over it. Oh, well, wh what to you are the modern applications of such a skill? You mentioned uh, as uh, in your time as a police officer and a firefighter in Huntsville, uh, you saw mostly gunshot wounds. Is there any modern application to knowing the sword? That's a good question. Uh, and I, I know a lot of people have thoughts on this and opinions on this. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I say this in the right way, not offend anybody. Cause I love the sword and a lot of my friends love the sword. Uh, but I feel like unless somebody, you know, if somebody does a home invasion on you, you're probably going to pull a fire on them. You're not going to go to your sword. Unless, Bob, there's, and I hate to use this terminology, unless there, some people say zombie apocalypse. But let's just say, I'm not going to say zombie apocalypse. I'm going to say, let's just say something happens to where uh, something bad happens in this world. And we're, you know, we're down to where you're having to survive of what you can get your hands on, feed yourself off of killing live game, uh, that sort of stuff. And then ammo eventually down the road, because it's going to be way down the road, because America has a lot of ammo yeah. and a lot of guns. But down the road, ammo runs out. Then I can see where a blade such as a sword would come in handy as far as self-defense. A, a blade's going to come in handy anyway in that scenario as far as processing game, uh, chopping vegetables, ch you know, chopping down trees to build your fire, well, you know, anything like that. A, a blade's going to come in handy. Don't get me wrong. But as far as self-defense goes, that's the only, that's the only thing I, I think it would be handy for at that time. You're not going to carry around a sword underneath your garment, or you're not going to wear it. Even though Texas, I hear, you can wear a sword in Texas. <laughs> uh, uh, you're not going to, because how the public sees it, you know. Uh, I, I do wear pretty large blades out in public sometimes. Uh, yeah, I, I would wear, I've worn this quite often. Wow, that's uh, cool. I wear this. 
from Kiku Matsuda. Ooh, Master Smith out of Japan. Hey, well, Steve, how much of the sword skill translates into knife skill or empty hand skill? Oh, it, it does. So, the, the, now the sword skill, when we get into that, we're talking about different ranges. So anybody that's familiar with, and there's, there's a lot of people that are familiar with the sword. You got your HEMA people who are extremely familiar with it. And I have respect for those people because they practice that art all the time. And then your Kenjitsu practitioners, I have high respect for those men and women that do that. Uh, but we're talking about range. So a sword is built for a certain range. Uh, but the way you can maneuver it and your awareness of the blade, how it cuts, some of that will transfer to a, a shorter blade. But not all of it will because this is a closer range application. And your maneuvers of how you would maneuver a blade. So if you come down at an angle strike, right? You're with one hand, uh, you're of the long sword, you're not gonna do that. European long sword, you're gonna use two hands and you may make a one cut at an angle. But this, as far as I'm talking about maneuvering it fast. So if you get to the Filipino FMA martial arts, Bob, you know what I'm talking about. So you come in straight, come in at different angles, right? different angles, applications. There's a different set of applications for a short blade in the closer range. There's a different application for a karambit, which I should have had up here because that's my short range favorite weapon. Uh, and I have some from Indonesia uh, that are extremely, extremely well built, extremely sharp. So th those, those require different techniques at close range. And, and there's been people that have built different blades for extreme close, close range, for grappling range. Uh, and I think you've went over some of those men that teach those combatives and have developed the, uh, and I can't remember the name of it, but it, it's a really, it's got like a ball grip and, and the blade is curved in. Uh, the, you're talking about the shiv works or you're talking about a, yes, the shiv yeah. works. So, and, and so that man, he knows he knows his stuff. Yeah, uh, I have followed him some. He's he's done the work. He's been undercover. He knows what it takes when you get in those scenarios, in a tight scenario. Whether you're sitting in a car as an undercover agent, and the person you're buying from, uh, they have uh, questions, and they start asking you, and they get the wrong feeling towards you, and then they attack you because they think you're a cop. Well, he's been in those situations. He knows. Close range, grappling range, what's going to work? What you can draw, how you can draw it, how how long the blade needs to be. Because you may not have room to draw a long blade. Yeah. And then when you're close in grappling with somebody, coming around them, and I don't mean to get gross or anything, but I'm saying if you have to come around the back of the neck, or back, mm -hmm. anywhere back, so you're around them and you're, you're able to access your blade, you know what I'm saying, Bob, that – that blade comes in handy because of the way it's designed and configured for that application. So there's different range. I, I, a sword, some of it's transferable to shorter blades, but not all of them. Uh, in, in the Filipino martial arts, at least as I've been exposed to them, um, the, where, where the swords themselves, except for, you know, with a, with a few exceptions, the swords themselves are about 29 inches or so. Uh, as the practice sticks are so about the length of the blade of an average katana um so so it's a shorter range weapon and it all oh there's that the beigler uh gununtic so so they they that short range uh weapon translates into a knife translates into empty hand pretty pretty flawlessly but when you start getting longer and the ranges get bigger uh it it changes uh, let's hold that up. Uh, I, I hefted one of these at Blade Show and really fell in love with it. Beautiful modern Gnunting by Beigler Bladeworks. Yeah, for Beigler. Brian Beigler. Beigler. Okay. Brian Beigler Bladeworks. Uh, yeah, it's a remarkable blade. Uh, and I, I'll say this about this. I, I told you, like, uh, that Kardashi that was made by Jeremy Boulder Valentine, by the way. Highly recommend him. He's an American blade maker, and I highly recommend Jeremy. He makes some incredible blades. But uh, 
this would be my second one as far as thrusting ability. The tip on this, when I say it's amazing, it's amazing. It doesn't matter how many layers of clothing you put on. Uh, mm. it, it's going to go through. I have tested this. And, and what's, uh, what's different about this tip to me is, and I, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with some of this, Bob, is this tip, uh, it's hard to explain. It comes to a rounded, extremely sharp tip. So where some blades, the geometry is more like a triangular point, And those come to a sharp oh, tip. Oh, okay. This is a point. It is a round, when I say rounded, it's it's extremely sharp point, but it's a rounded sort of tip geometry. And so that, it thrusts through everything. It's it's incredible. That I, I know what you're saying. It kind of comes to like uh, if you will, a pencil tip. Yes. Um yes. that that seems great. And and there are a uh, I can't name them, but there are a lot of examples where I've seen thrusting uh knives throughout history that have tips like that uh and then the blade changes after the tip yeah this is gorgeous you got about six inches of the top edge sharp yes. um uh, man that that is a, a a definitely an enviable blade um so with all of this and with uh you know having the medical training uh have having i'm just talking about the average person because i want to get your advice on this um, so we've, we've talked about, uh, knives, self-defense, uh, and medical training to make sure that, uh, if your knife hobby gets out of hand for a, uh, an instant, you can take care of yourself. Uh, but what about exercise? What about, uh, staying in shape? You obviously are in great shape. We've seen, or I've seen on Instagram, you, um, uh, deadlifting 450 pounds, 10 times in a row, you know, or, or what have you, um, obviously fitness means something to you. What, what, what advice do you give people about the importance of that, especially when it comes to self-defense, especially when it comes to survival or, or enjoying the hobby of sword play? So there's a lot of aspects to, uh, and I'll, I'll say this about martial arts and, and, and blade works in, in the martial arts. You have some people who are, uh, they, they, they look from the outside. Bob, you can't always judge a book by its cover, for instance. They look, they look like they might be out of shape, but they're in better shape than you think they are. Uh, and they are highly skilled with the blade, highly skilled with the blade. Uh, I've seen some of those individuals. But I, I will say this, even if you're highly skilled, if you run up against somebody who is also highly skilled, but is extremely fit, that's where you're going to run into trouble. So if you have an untrained person and a highly, highly skilled person who's in all right shape, you know, I'm going to say all right this person is going to win out the highly skilled person but if you have a person equal skill level but is in a lot better shape than you you're going to lose because fatigue makes cowards of us all and uh strength is going to come into because if you have a man who is highly skilled and let's say you're highly skilled yourself and you can block some of his maneuvers or whatever but when he gets into grappling range and gets a hold of you, it's it's a different ball game. And and a person that's out of shape, and, and, when it, and it, let's say it comes to hands, right? Uh, the person that's, they may have a minute or two minutes at the most in them. And there's a lot of people out there that, that think they can uh, fight, Bob, and they might can go hard a minute or two. Yeah. But if there's a person that, that knows what they're doing, uh, you're going to have to last a lot longer than that. And that's where fitness and strength come into play. Uh, even being able to maneuver a blade. Back, but that, this canoe team is very light. But your power and speed and, and your, your force equal mass times acceleration, right? So when you can maneuver a blade extremely fast from the power that you can generate, 
that that cutting ability is exponentially advanced up upwards. So, and and that even coming even even working out with a blade, right? If you work out with a blade for a period of time, you can see how maneuvering with a blade and and your footwork and and doing everything it. You got to be in shape to do that. You you look at a lot of the HEMA competitions, and uh, those those guys that are like really upper level, they are in great great shape. Uh, so yeah, fitness comes into it because you know you you have to have the cardiovascular along with the, the strength, uh, and that's why when I was forty four, like I said, I'm fifty seven now, but when I was forty four, I started doing a uh, CrossFit. And uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of opinions about CrossFit and everything else. But I, I've been in global gyms all my life and grew up doing martial arts and everything. But as far as functional fitness, having the cardio, the VO2 max, the strength, being able to move your body with explosive power, I've, I've not found anything like that. And I started when I was sports. So I've been doing it for 13 years. <laughs> and it kept me in great shape as a firefighter. I wish I'd have had it back when I was a police officer, but they didn't have it back then. Uh, but yeah, fitness, fitness is key. It is training is key. Fitness is key. Having the right instructors key. There, there's a lot of keys to that journey. Well, uh, one last question before I let you go. And it's about the journey, if you will. And it's about the collecting. Um, what recommendation, what advice do you give uh, someone who's new, who, who wants to have a collection like yours, they want to have exotic weapons from actual makers from around the world. How do you start? Uh, I don't mind anybody that wants to contact me, Bob, because they may not know the makers to contact. And, and I'll say this, I, I, I want to support our American blade makers. Uh, they've been good to me. For instance, Oh, this God. is the Wakazashi from Forged and Fire Champion James Helm. Yeah, that is gorgeous. And I bought this at Blade Show year before last. I've done demos with this. It's an exceptional blade. Exceptional blade. And Americans, because of our economy, Bob, and the high cost of living, People need to understand American bladesmiths, and, and I'm not talking about like cold steel, right? I'm not talking about the Raja, which you can get for seventy dollars or eighty dollars or whatever. Which I love this blade, but it, it, you know, that's coming from a big company that processes a lot of blades, that manufactures a lot of blades. To get to get a custom blade, it's very it's, it's pretty expensive here in America. You can get a high quality blade overseas, uh, delivered to you in a very short time, made by some some men of, of great integrity, forging blades like their ancestors did. Anybody that, that I, I would I would recommend starting out with with those blades because they're not too expensive. They're they're not expensive at all. And then when you get into the hobby and you want to go with like Brian's blade or James blade or blade from me from Kiku Matsuda, uh, or let me see here. Oh, and so I'm going to show this blade real quick. So this, oh, blade, this is... a, a lot of people love this blade. That's so cool. So the Raja Wally that's from Shani Amram Pinata out of Indonesia. That blade is incredible itself. So you can get a blade like this for a reasonable price. And then you've got blade, blade makers like Christopher Linton, who I'm good friends with. And he started working for uh, RMJ Tactical. He, he's a custom mm -hmm. blade maker. But this is the samurai buoy that he forged out. Oh. Uh, WT that is Phil. something else with that sub hilt. I love that. Yes. It is. It is an incredible, incredible blade. I've done. A, I've done tatami cuts with this uh, back when I was getting some tatami mats in, and it's it's an incredible blade. 
But that's a samurai boy knife. And, and so, yeah, start out with something relatively inexpensive, but, 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 high, but, but it's high quality. And then you can work your way up to some of the custom makers. Uh, you know, a lot of this I got at Blade Show starting out. I've been, I think, four or five years. Uh, and, and you get to see some, I, I highly recommend everybody going to Blade Show. The community is incredible. Everybody is very humble. Even the bladesmiths are very humble. There's, there are bladesmiths there with two, three, four thousand dollar blades on their table. And a person may walk up and they, the blade maker themselves may know, Bob, that this person probably is not going to buy their blade. Oh, yeah. Of how expensive it is. But they will talk to that person just as if they were talking to somebody who was a millionaire who walked up, who was absolutely going to buy that blade. That's what I love about the blade community. It's a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And everybody at Blade Show is so humble, so nice and kind. Uh, and it, it's the best community. It is the best community. Uh, I couldn't agree more with you, Steve. Uh, great way to great words to end on. It is a great community, and uh, it's people like you, people like me, people like all of us uh, getting together, talking about these things, and also sharing uh, sharing our love. Some people love sports small edc some people love uh slip joints some fixed blades some swords but we kind of all come together around the sharpened uh heat treated steel steve price blade tastic knives thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast it's been a pleasure to have this time talking with you thank you so much bob it, it's been an honor and a privilege love your show uh you, you, you are the best i mean you you do the best job you have some incredible incredible people on your show and uh, you do so much for the Blade community, uh, and, and we value you. I want you to know that. The community value you. You, you. you are exceptional at what you do. And I hope to see you at Blade Show this year. Absolutely. Uh, yes, yes, sir. All right. Well, thank you for those kind words. Put wind in my sails, sir. Yes, All right. Sir. You take care. You too. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Price of Blade Tastic Knives. Those are that's his uh, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube handle, and and his advice a lot like um, mine. It seems like uh, when I talk about getting into custom fixed blades, starting small and starting with people uh, whose work you like. Maybe you're scrolling on Instagram. That's how I find them, um, and then starting small and building up. And uh, you could have an amazing collection of, of custom swords yourself. All right. Be sure to join us uh, on Wednesday for the midweek supplemental, Thursday for Thursday Night Knives at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on U YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And we'll see you there. All right. For Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast